All right, and we are live. Welcome, Facebook family, to the Word Among Us interview series, where we interview inspiring Catholic leaders. And I'm very, very excited today that we have Father John Ricardo. He is a has been a priest for, I believe, 25 years now, if I do my math correctly. Um, he's the founder of Acts 29, which I want to hear about. He is a podcaster, uh, radio host, and he is an author, and he has just this came out this past year, Rescued, which I want to get into because I love this book so much. And we have a new book that we can talk about. Welcome, Father John. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's great being with you. And so where are you joining us from today? Just outside Detroit, but uh, 20 minutes north. Okay. And how is the weather? Uh, is it cold winter weather yet? Or is it nice? You know, we had, uh, we had 50 degrees yesterday. It was great, but it's snowing right now. So uh, this is. is Michigan in December. So. There it, is. Uh, it looks like Advent. We don't mind it. That's nice. Yeah, we had like 70 degree weather out here and now it's, we're back down as well. Um, I love so, snow for like three days and then I can go. Yeah, I, exactly. I don't want any of the bad traffic or the mm -hmm. shoveling or all of that. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so Father John, did I get it right that you have been a priest for 25 years? That's right. 25 last, uh, last May, May of uh, 2021. Awesome. Congratulations. Um, can you Thanks. give me a brief, uh, brief version of how you found yourself uh, becoming a priest? Yeah, I'll make it really brief. Jesus <laughs> asked me. How about that? <laughs> um, I was, uh, I'd never thought of it uh, really in my life. You know, I think every boy probably does who goes to Catholic school and I went to Catholic school, but um, I was uh, 24, 25 years old and I was out of college. I was working and I would, I had, been in a long-term relationship, um, which uh, had ended and uh, considered looking at religious life with uh, actually not Catholic, but interdenominational a uh, group of guys who were really significant for me and my uh, college years that led to kind of a deepening conversion, but that didn't seem to fit either. And so I was just, I, I was like a lot of people at that age in life. I was hungry for something great to do with my life. I just didn't know what it was. I just wanted meaning, you know, I didn't want money. I wanted meaning. And um couldn't find it. And one day uh, I happened to be reading my Bible at work and uh, my lunch hour and came across a passage where Jesus talks about those who renounce marriage for the sake of the kingdom. And I knew he was talking to me. And um, I just kind of almost threw the Bible up in the air. I'm like, Lord, you got to be kidding me. Like, what do you want me to do with my life? And like, I can hear these leaf blowers outside my window right now. Um, I heard a voice that just said, John, I'm invite you to live single and to do it as a priest. Wow. And I said, you've got to be kidding. I wasn't even going to church at the time. Uh, and I just said, Lord, if that's really you, you need to give me a desire for that because I don't want to do that. And within two days, uh, I think I woke up with uh, just un unbelievable clarity on what I was made to do with my life. And I quit my job and went to seminary. Wow. That's incredible because I can um, believe that it's very easy to throw the Bible up or throw your hands up and then not ask for the clarity and not ask for uh, God's will to be done because that's a, that seems like a very, like, it's a huge life change, you know? Um, so I can't imagine being in that situation, but that's awesome. That's an awesome story. I, I describe it now. It's as if looking back now, it's as if I felt this tap on my shoulder from behind and it was Jesus and as I turned around, he pointed to something. He says, everything you're looking for is there. Wow. And, and without having ever thought of priesthood. So it's like I turned and I looked and I went, I think you're right. How, how can that be? And, um, and he was. I mean, that's exactly what he, he made me for. And, um, and uh, to, to the topic at hand, I mean, I increasingly so. I just feel like the Lord really, he created me for lots of things, right? But I think a huge part of the mission that the Lord has given to me is to, is to preach the gospel in a way right now that is accessible to people. And please, God, accomplishes what Pope John Paul II said the proclamation of the gospel is supposed to do, which is um, to lead people to be overwhelmed and to surrender to Jesus. That's awesome. So, 
I will say this book rescued um, the unexpected and extraordinary news of the gospel does just that. Um, I finished it this week and it's so accessible and simple, but overwhelming. So I wanted to get your thoughts for anyone who hasn't read it, it is speaking to people's hearts. Like it is uh, become a very popular book. Um, there's no other way to say it. And why do you think that um, so many people are responding to this? Well, because the gospel's because the gospel is extraordinary news. That's why. And I think, unfortunately, um, most people have never heard it, right. I, I, including in the church. You know, forget about the people who are, you know, falling away or the nuns or whatever. I don't think most people in the Catholic Church have ever actually really heard the gospel. I don't think I preached the gospel in the sense of uh, what we do there until I don't know five six years ago. But I I, I am convinced right now that the single most urgent pastoral evangelistic task in the Catholic church is a compelling proclamation of the gospel in such a way that people can get it. And every time we do this, I mean, it's meant to be preached live, obviously, um, because faith comes through hearing, but every time we preach it or every time someone reads the book, we hear someone say something like, why have I never heard this before? That's right. Um, so what we, in, fa in fact, right now it's, it's uh, beautiful. The archdiocese of Denver, all throughout Advent, uh, the whole archdiocese is going through basically a retreat uh, during Mass on Sundays, and they're using those four words that are the really the center of how the Lord kind of led us to preach the gospel, created, captured, rescued, and response. So no matter no matter where you go to church in Denver, as an example, um, people are hearing the gospel, and it's a it, it flows from Archbishop Aquila's. Um, agreement with our conviction that this is the most urgent thing that people need to hear right now. And only afterwards can all the other things that are so important, do they make sense? Right. And, and that's right. And it's kind of how you paint the, the picture in the beginning is, yeah, a lot of people don't know the story. Um, we are, we kind of find ourselves on a page in history and it's kind of like, okay, we're here. Um, but we don't really know the whole story of the gospel and what's happened and those four words um, that you mentioned created captured rescued and then response um how did you come because you just mentioned so I, I thought of this question that you weren't necessarily preaching this before like how did you come to think of um think of this message and think of this book it was another divine inspiration type so i love to read and um and I don't have an original thought um, in my mind, uh, I don't think, but I, I love to read and I assimilate authors. Uh, so I like to take things from different places. And, and probably six years ago now, I had come across a, a book by an author named Fleming Rutledge um, called uh, The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ, which I think Bishop Barron had spoken about one time. And so I bought it and it came and it was like that thick. And I thought, okay, great, I'll read that at Lent. And I went on retreat, I read it at Lent, and it was one of the life-changing books I've ever read in my life. Fleming Rutledge is a retired woman Anglican priest. And um, if you'd told me 25 years ago when I was in the seminary that one of my favorite authors was gonna be a woman Anglican priest, I probably would have uh, challenged that. She is extraordinary and I love her to no end. And this book, I, I remember uh, to this day, actually, I was on retreat with a friend of mine and I looked at him and I says, I have to find a way to make this accessible for people because I don't think most people are going to read this because this is changing my life. And so uh, I think that Easter triduum, uh, I, I, I kind of did a first attempt at really just kind of preaching what became uh, rescued. And then over the next number of years in every setting that I did, I teach RCIA or I did. So I would use that as the way in. And then in a, in a really significant moment, I was given a talk out in Colorado and Curtis Martin was there, who's, you know, the founder of Focus and uh, who I, I just respect greatly. And I asked him for his feedback afterwards. It was like a 45, maybe 60 minute presentation. And it was one of the first presentations I'd given on this. And I asked him, I said, was that helpful? Did that make sense? And he said something to the effect of, uh, that was the best presentation of the gospel I've ever heard. It's not repeatable. You have to find a way to make it repeatable. And that's very helpful feedback. Right. You know, like useless feedback is, oh, that was great. You know, like, why was it great? You know, or that was terrible. Well, why was it terrible? 
And so in large part, praying about his comment to me, I just, uh, I would get into lots of conversations with the people I was working with at the time saying, help me find a way to make this repeatable. And I mean, how hard is it to remember four words? Yeah. So that's how the gospel became, or the kerygma. So when, we, when I say gospel, I don't mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and I don't mean the totality. I, I mean, really the kerygma, which just means the proclamation, um, the, the, the core, the essence of the gospel, which classically in the church means, you know, the goodness of creation, sin and its consequences, God's response to our sin, and then our response to what God has done. That's still a mouthful. So we, we, we turned it into four words and then just hung lots of stories on it to try to help people understand, especially the two middle parts, mm. just how bad things are. Um, so one of the things the Lord is, I think, led us to do is to put the enemy squarely in his light, uh, the Lord's light. Um, the, the, you know, that second part, sin and its consequences, has a question connected with it. And the question is something like, why is everything so messed up? And this is a very important question right now in the culture that we're living in, because we live in a kind of a post-enlightenment culture, which means we've rejected the fall, we've rejected the spiritual world, which means we've rejected hell and the demonic. But because there's still so much evil happening, I, I live in Metro Detroit, we just had another school shooting this past week, and there's four kids dead. So everywhere you look, you see evil. And if the demonic doesn't exist, then I have to find somebody to blame. And that's what we're seeing in our country right now, right? We're blaming a, a race or a gender or a socioeconomic class or whoever it might be. But one of the essential parts of the biblical vision is to understand the enemy is the enemy, which is to say the devil. And no human being is my enemy as a disciple of Jesus. They might be being used by the enemy, deceived by the enemy, but they're not the enemy. Um, so we really try to highlight who he is and just how bad the fall is and the consequence of that and why we're utterly hopeless without Jesus. But then in doing that, what, what do you get? You get an image of Jesus then, uh, which as I would say is, um, helps you understand Jesus is more than just kind. Like he is kind, right. but he's absolutely unconquerable. And, uh, and especially for a man, I can't, I, I have no idea uh, how a woman thinks, sorry. Um, but as a man, like, that's so important. Like, Jesus is, is, is the one who's calling me to follow him. He's the one who's calling us to follow him and to, and to embark on this great campaign of sabotage, as C.S. Lewis puts it. Um, and he's, he can't lose, which is not to be naive. It's not to be optimistic. I mean, I think it's going to get really hard in this country to be a disciple. But who cares? Like, Jesus has conquered death. I'm just not afraid of that. Right. I'm not crazy about how I'm going to die, but I'm not afraid of dying. Yeah, we, that part's not so. Well, I love that um, you just talked about that and how <clears throat> you really can't get the message of the rescue without understanding the enemy. And I love how you put it so simply, right? And it's like, I think you mentioned that question rescued, pardon my French, but you're like, what the heck happened? Um, and I love how you taught, you know, um, we were created to be friends with each other. We were created in love. Like that we are so, it's like such a beautiful thing. And then, you know, this evil, this enemy comes in and, you know, he's envious of us. He's envious of like the good in this world, but there's like something that conquers all of it. And that's why I love this book so much. And I want to, cause you touched on it briefly, like the rescue part and the really like, how did we get this cover? How did we get to this image of this battlefield and this just intense, like coming out of this war. Yeah, because so uh, it, it's funny because I had lots of conversations with some of the folks at the Word Among Us when we were making this. Um, the bad news is horrific. I mean, it's really horrific. It's worse than our worst nightmare. And um, <laughs> the, the response sometimes was people are not going to want to read this. And I'm like, I know, uh, but they have to. Because if we don't get this, we will never understand the good news. You, you, we won't know why the gospel is good news if we don't know how bad the bad news is. And so 
just real quick, I mean, the bad news is this. When, when, we, when we fell for the deception of Satan, uh, who was a good creature, who rebelled out of envy of us, as you just said, uh, what happened was uh, we sold ourselves into slavery as a race to powers that we can never defeat on our own. And the powers are death and sin. And so we're, we're seeing this in the country right now and in the world, right? We are paralyzed by the fear of COVID or whatever the next variant is. Um, the world is bound by the fear of death and I'm going to die and there's nothing I can do to stop it. I might be able to delay it, but I can't stop it. That wasn't God's plan. It's here because we, we chose unknowingly to sell ourselves into slavery to that. And then to the power of sin too, which is not first and foremost something that we do or that we don't do. Um, St. Paul in a special way talks about sin and death uh, as if they're governments. You know, they're, they're, they dominate the human race. Um, it's why we don't do the things we want to do and we do the things that we hate. And so there's no way out. And the, and the strongest image for that that I know is the image of being captured by a human trafficker. Um, and how utterly hopeless that is. No one knows where you are and no one's coming for you. And then into that situation, this hopeless, utterly bleak situation, comes this incredible act by God, um, which is his rescue. And so the, the reason behind the cover of the book, um, as it's been said by a number of authors, um, the incarnation, we're about to you know, celebrate Christmas, um, the incarnation is the invasion of one kingdom by a stronger kingdom. So God becomes a man, not to tell stories, not to do miracles, although he told stories and he did miracles. God becomes a man to go to war for me and for you and for everybody uh, to do battle against the strong man, which is what Jesus calls Satan, and to defeat him in an incredibly clever way. Um, and, and it's all very personal. Like for me, the strongest image of this now, my, uh, my uncle who's passed away, my uncle my, and my father fought in World War II. Mm -hmm. and, and my uncle um, liberated his hometown. So he was from Italy, from the southern part of Italy, and he liberated his town. And so it, the significance of that for me is these people weren't strangers. This was his, these were his cousins, these were his family who he was freeing from the grip of Nazi Germany um, in, a, in a similar way, but even more powerfully, um, God became a man to get his family back. And that's, that's what you mean to him. So powerful. And I love that you talk about um, D-Day too, like the same thing. It's like when it's, when, you know, Europe was liberated, it wasn't just like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, we are saved. And it's- exactly. We don't have that, or I'll speak for myself. I don't always have that same feeling, you know, but reading this, it was overwhelming. It was like, this is good. <laughs> this is the greatest news. Um, Absolutely. So this book is awesome. I wanted to ask you, what is, what's the best way for Catholics um, to read this book? Because you mentioned that, I, you said that um, in Denver, the Archdiocese of Denver was going through this. Um, What's the best way for someone to read it, pray about it, experience it? Uh, that's a great question. I'd say uh, a couple things. One would be with a Bible in hand. Okay. Because um, uh, it's, it's meant to really, I mean, the power comes from scripture, right? So this is meant to be a way to pull us into scripture. Um, and then second, in, in a group, you know, a small group uh, for a lot of reasons right now. I mean, COVID has made us all really hungry for community. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we need not only this vertical relationship with Jesus, but we need this horizontal relationship with each other. And so I would encourage people to, you know, try to consider getting into a small group, four or five people and read it. And, then, you know, there's some really simple questions at the end of every chapter that are meant to just kind of slowly start to facilitate conversation. Um, and then we're actually we're, we're creating right now. We created a video series that. Um, goes along with it that's called the rescue project which is um it's nine videos um you know of of me preaching it basically with um 
some other folks who've put some uh, some video clips in it to try to help amplify the what, what's being preached, and and that'll come out sometime in I don't know spring or so. But uh, it's it's meant to be a companion to this, so that we can just continue to help people to to hear, to understand, and to surrender to Jesus uh, wholeheartedly, and then to be on then to be on mission, right? Because here's the challenge I think for a lot of Catholics, we not only don't know who Jesus is and what he did. There's, there's little clarity on his mission, um, but there's little clarity on our mission. Mm. So we have some dear friends who are Marines who are, uh, they, they listened to one of the podcasts we do and they had said something to the effect of, you guys, you, you sound like Marines when you talk sometimes. And I said, thanks. I think that's a compliment. But um, she says, when we're training, she's a woman who works in the Pentagon now. She says, well, we're training our young officers. We beat into their heads like, you have got to help your soldiers have uh, utmost clarity on we're doing X in order to Y. Mm. If they don't know that the answer to the in order to, then chaos reigns. And right now in the, in the church, there's very little clarity, I think, on Jesus sends us out as disciples in order to what? Mm. What, what are we supposed to be doing right now? And this is a huge dimension for us in the world in which we're living. And, and our answer would be um, to continue the work of recreation, which he began on Easter Sunday, and which he will bring to a glorious conclusion when he comes back um, at the end of time. But there's work right now for us to do. And so there's all these ways to understand the mission, where, which is much larger than just growing in holiness. Right as important as that is, like he calls us to be agents of transformation and recreation and restoration and healing um, and resistance. Um, so there's so many examples of that, that we can look at through the history of the church, but the, the result of that is hopefully we get mobilized for mission mm -hmm. and get out of the walls of the church and get out of our homes to tell the people that are surrounding us who have no hope apart from Jesus, uh, what he's done and why they can have hope. Wow. Yeah. I think it's so easy. I mean, it's easy for me to be like, this book is great and internalize it. And then, yes, it's what's the next step. So what, um, have you gotten feedback? Can you share any like feedback that you've gotten from folks that have heard the, heard the mission or read the book? Yeah, so it's inter we do it a lot for priests, actually, um, so, and, which is really uh, a joy, quite frankly, because priesthood is it's easy to get very discouraged. Uh, you know, if you read the data, it looks like everything's going down and, you know, like last one out, turn out the lights. Uh, and it's it's easy to forget that Jesus is Lord. And that's more than a prayer or the ending of a prayer. It's a reality. So to say Jesus is Lord means nobody else is. And we don't have to be nervous right now. So it might look like everything's out of control. It's not. Like God's not pulling his hair out right now as he looks down on us. Um, he is, he has everything firmly in his hands. And he will bring everything to a glorious conclusion. So when we preach it to priests, we find um, oftentimes just great uh, encouragement, refreshment, hope. I mean, that's really at the heart of it, right? When we preach it to lay people, it, it's usually a combination of being overwhelmed and somewhat frustrated. Like, mm. why don't I hear this? Mm. Um, why haven't I heard this? Um, and uh, the most powerful story. So uh, I'll give you an image real quick to, to give you, a, to set up this uh, anecdote, but I don't know if you've ever seen the the show, The Man in the High Castle. It's a bizarre show on Amazon oh, Prime. Yeah. I do, I don't recommend it. Just to be clear, um, <laughs> but um, there's a scene in it which I find is simply the most powerful scene for the the power of stories and the power of the gospel. And so the, the Man in the High Castle is a fictional uh, look at what would happen if the U.S. lost World War II. And so it takes place in the United States in the early 60s. And, you know, like from the Rocky Mountains East is Nazi America. And from the Rocky Mountains West is the Empire of Japan and America. And the people have been living in, you know, slavery and torture and concentration camps and tyranny for 17 years or so. 
And this one woman who turns out to be the lead figure in the show, the very first episode, her sister is a member of the resistance and she's killed. And before she dies, she hands her sister a package and the package is a reel of film. And in the first episode, it shows this woman for like four or five minutes. She walks into it, she finds a projector and you don't even see what she's watching. All you see is her face and she's watching something. And as, as soon as it ends, she goes back and she rewinds it and she watches it again. And then she rewinds it and watches it again. And she rewinds it and watches it again. And when she starts it the first time, her face is one of anxiety, fear, terror. And by the time she gets done, she's crying, she's smiling, and she mouths the words, yes. And it turns out what she's watching, you finally see what she's watching, and she sees allies landing at Normandy and the unconditional surrender of Japan and the end of the Nazi Reich. And her boyfriend walks in and says, what are you watching? And she says, I'm watching war footage. And he says, yeah, I see that. And she says, it shows us winning the war. And he says, but we didn't win the war. And she says, that's what they told us. That is the best image I know for what we're living in right now. So she, she is like us in this culture right now. We're watching the wrong reel. We're watching a movie, if you will, that's telling us that God is absent um, or he's not real, that evil is stronger, that there's no point in life. Just get what you can, live for yourself. It's all kind of futile. And the reality is there's another, there's another story. Yes. And so I, I share that because uh, every time somebody comes to see me as a priest, before they, you know, nobody comes to see a priest to say, hey, life is great. I just thought I'd tell you that. <laughs> Um, it's usually a problem. And so I've just learned to ask, you know, like, so what is it you hope I can do for you? So this woman came to see me one time. She was the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life. She was probably like mid to late twenties. I'd never met her before. She wasn't a member of the parish where I was. I don't know how she got to me. Um, very successful. And her life was a train wreck. And so I asked her, what is it you're hoping for? And she told me. And so I said, before I, before I do that, can I just tell you how I see the world? Because if I don't tell you that, you're not, nothing I'm going to say is going to make sense. And I took like five minutes to tell the story or in the image of the man in the high castle to play the gospel real. When I got done, she was on the floor crying her eyes out. And she says to me, um, that's not the God I knew growing up. Mm. And I think that woman is everywhere. Yeah. And, and so to, to be able to play the real for people and to show them the real story uh, is just so, um, like I can't think of anything greater to do with my life, quite honestly. That's awesome. I got chills um, when you were telling that the imagery story um, from that show and I had seen that, uh, but it's true. Like, I think that woman that you mentioned is everywhere. You know, you think life is a zero sum game. You think we're all here to either win or lose. And um, most of the time you can feel like you're losing and that's not the, the real story. Nope. This book incredible and we're running <laughs> close to time everyone should get a copy i'm going to put the link up um underneath and i'm excited to see more about that video project that you mentioned too because i think you're right no matter how you hear it um watch it read it whatever it takes um so we're excited to see more about that and i do want to give a shout out to to um everyone watching father ricardo just came out with a new book and it's called learning to trust from mary and it's meditations on the rosary it's a beautiful book and i have just started the introduction which i hear is the best part or one of the best parts i'll say um but it's filled with beautiful art so we'll put up links for this and um father john before you go i do have two quick questions i want to ask you that we've been asking some of the folks we've interviewed um 
the first one is what would you say to those who have stopped going to church during the pandemic and don't see a good reason to go back? Uh, two words, the Eucharist. Mm. You know, I think, so I, I think quite candidly, uh, speaking as a priest, a lot of people are angry at the church um, because their churches got closed in many places and they feel like the church abandoned them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really hard to acknowledge and to hear, but I think it's true in some places. Um, and uh, the devil wins if we don't go back and, and the, be, because the devil knows how strong the Eucharist is. So the simple truth is, you know, if I don't eat for a number of months, I'm going to die. And if I don't eat for a number of days, I'm going to get weak. And the same thing is true spiritually. Like the Eucharist is simply uh, that without which we cannot truly live. And so despite all the things that have gone on over the last, you know, almost two years now and all the frustrations and all the disappointments that people have, trust me, nobody has more disappointments with the church than a priest because like I'm inside, I see how the sausage is made. Um, uh, go, go back. Uh, you, we need Jesus, you know, like either Jesus was lying when he says, um, uh, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life or he wasn't and Jesus does not lie. Uh, so run back because of that. I love that. Um, the second question, the last question we have is when you arrive in heaven, what would you like to hear God say to you? Well done. Mm. Great, great answer. Um, Father John Ricardo, it has been a blessing to speak with you today. Um, like I said, love this book. Um, I'm going to reread it, and I really look forward to this new book, uh, Learning to Trust Our Mary Meditations on the Rosary. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great and being with you. Thanks. Before you go, can you just say a quick prayer um, for all those watching? Absolutely. Let's pray uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, especially in these Advent days through the intercession of St. Joseph and uh, Our Lady. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit descend upon all of you and all your loved ones. May God fill you with unshakable confidence in the one who makes a way out of no way and for whom nothing is impossible. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father John, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.